This is a pretty short lecture. I just want to step you through a few tips and tricks and show you some examples, show you some pictures of when things go wrong and what the response looked like when things go wrong so you can be a little bit intuitive when things are going wrong, what might the problem be. So I'm going to start off by introducing a device called a guided mode resonance filter. And the reason I'm introducing this device is that it is very, very sensitive to its size and material properties. So I think it's a really good device to benchmark your codes. If you can model a guided mode resonance filter and get the correct answer, chances are pretty good that your code is working. So I think they're wonderful from that perspective. And they're kind of neat devices in, in themselves. I want to talk about some things for finite difference frequency domain for periodic structures and then also for non-periodic devices. And we kind of waved our hands a bit and we said a lot of times we're going to make an approximation that something's infinitely periodic. And I want to show you a few pictures that actually quantify that and justify where it's valid uh, to give you a feel of really what that approximation means. Guided mode resonance filters. In a guided mode resonance filter, there's two things happening at the same time, diffraction and wave guiding. So we have an incoming wave, and it sees a grating. So it diffracts into these multiple directions. We also have a high index region surrounded by two low index regions. So this is a slab wave guide. Well, under very, very special circumstances, one of these diffracted modes matches exactly a guided mode. And in fact, we can couple energy from the external wave into a guided mode. When that happens, we establish this magical thing called a guided mode resonance. When this isn't the case, when we're not diffracting into a guided mode, the wave really just sees this as a, a multi-layer structure like you'd calculate with transfer matrix method. And we get this background response. The red line is reflectance, blue line is transmittance. But this magical, very narrow range of frequencies where we couple into a guided mode, what we see is the reflection and transmission actually reverses and we get this very, very narrow band of resonance. So it's a very good way to realize a narrow filter. So this plot is a typical response of a guided mode resonance filter. Here is a different picture of physically what is happening. When we're away from resonance, the wave just passes through, and it, it really just sees an average refractive index, and you can calculate that background response very accurately just with transfer matrix method. So here's a wave passing through this device. We can see a little bump of something here, and that's where the device is. But for the most part, it just has the response of this being an average layer and not really a grading. On the resonance, the wave comes in, it couples into a guided mode, and as that guided mode propagates, it slowly leaks out of the guide. The leaked wave and the original applied wave interfere and produces the overall frequency response. Now, if I were to plot the field on resonance, this is what it would look like. And this looks very much like a guided mode. Now, just due to the color scaling, because the field here is enhanced, you know, 20 to 40 times, something like that, we don't see the applied wave, but it is there. Uh, if the colors come through good enough, you can see a little bit of the applied wave. But for the most part, the fields are so intense here that it washes that out so you can't see it. Maybe if I plot it on a leak or a, a log scale, you'd see it. So guided mode resonance filters have this condition where it has to match one of the diffracted waves into a guided mode. That is a very, very sensitive phase matching condition. It's very sensitive to the mechanical dimensions. It's very sensitive to the material properties both in the device and on the outside. It's very sensitive to angle of incidence. It is very sensitive to the polarization. And it is very sensitive to frequency. So it's a really, really touchy device, which makes it a great device to benchmark your codes. If we can take the guided mode resonance filter with a known response, and if you can replicate that, there's a real good chance that your code works. So when I develop a new code, I take it through a series of exercises to benchmark it. One of them you saw in your transfer matrix method homework, where we just look at 
completely free space. You get 100% transmission, 0% reflection. Then we put in something with a refractive index of 3, and we should see a 25% reflection, 75% transmission, and we gradually work up the complexity to, to ring out the code. Then when we move into multiple dimensions, the next step is putting in a guided mode resonance filter. And when that works, uh, as I mentioned, a pretty good chance your, your code is working. So if there's anything wrong, the guided mode resonance filter will amplify it. But even if you do replicate this, that's no guarantee that your code is 100% working. It's just one more level of confidence that it is working. This is the guided mode resonance filter that I always use to benchmark my codes. And I don't think there's anything about this that makes it better than another guided mode resonance filter. I think the thing about this is I just am easily able to remember these numbers. But we'll model this as a 2D structure so that there'll be a, an E mode response and an H mode response. So notice the background response is pretty constant. That's what you would model with transfer matrix method. But they de definitely does have a polarization response and it produces resonance at two different wavelengths. So that's all I have to say about guided mode resonance filters. Now I want to talk about finite difference frequency domain for periodic structures. A lot of this won't be a, a surprise to you, but I do want to step you through what could go wrong and what are some good practices for modeling these. So here's the basic grid setup. We're going to have our device somewhere in the middle of the grid. We're going to use periodic boundary conditions on the left and the right. So hopefully whatever materials you have at the left look very similar to what's on the right. And so this would essentially repeat indefinitely in the horizontal direction. We also want a PML at the top and the bottom to absorb outgoing waves. We want some space between the device and the PML because we don't want evanescent fields. For example, we have a guided mode in here. If it's a guided mode resonance filter, it's evanescent field sticks outside of this and decays. We don't want that to touch the PML. We know we're going to have a total field scatter field interface to launch a one-way source down towards the device. We need a little bit of space between the PML and where we inject the source because that's where we're going to be recording our reflected fields. And we'll record our transmitted fields down near the bottom somewhere. So this is the basic grid scheme for modeling a periodic structure. This is a good simulation. And notice all the signs of a good simulation. All of the curves here are smooth and continuous. That tells us that we're not missing any information. Both the transmitted and reflected lines are smooth and continuous. There's no triangles or, or anything weird. I'll show you a picture of that on a, on a following slide. Also, I always check for conservation of energy. So if I add these two, reflectance and transmittance, I get conservation of energy. Notice it is flat all the way across. So conservations behave uh, satisfied to darn near 100% all the way across. And in the response, I don't see any weird rolling behavior. And you'll see that in a few slides and why that's a sign that things are going wrong. So this is an example of a good simulation. Okay, so here's two plots plotting the same device, but notice on the left I see triangles. This tells me we're missing information. Well, if we go ahead and we fill in that information, now we see nice smooth lines, and you can see this tells a completely different story. Reflectance actually goes up to 100%. Down here, we only got it at 60%. So anytime I see triangles in a response, that immediately tells me we're missing information. All of the lines should look smooth and continuous. Now here's a trick. We could get away with points spaced farther apart out here where the line is, is relatively flat, but where it's changing abruptly, we may want to add a whole bunch of points. So your frequency or wavelength axis does not have to be uniform. We can construct it with different step sizes. So from 540 to 550, we might go in steps of 1. But then from 550 up to 553, we go in steps of 0.01. And then back to steps of 1 again to generate a plot like this that looks nice and smooth. So, or you could just have fine points everywhere.
Here's an example of some rolling behavior. What we've done here is use poor grid resolution. Our delta x and delta y parameters are too large. We really can't sufficiently resolve the wavelength. Now notice we're violating conservation of energy, particularly at the shorter wavelengths. For a particular grid resolution, this is where the, uh, the errors will be most severe. As our wavelength gets longer, the grid cells get smaller relative to the wavelength, and in fact, the answer becomes more accurate. And you can see this conservation line starts to approach 100%. Still not perfect, but, and the rolling behavior disappears. Now, the reason for the rolling behavior is just extremely, extremely poor accuracy. Things aren't working as well. Uh, we can get extra scattering that shouldn't be there, so we get standing waves, um, all kinds of crazy stuff. Also notice, that there's a shifted spectral response. This spike should be closer to 550, but it has shifted. And that's due to the numerical dispersion that we talked about. It's much more severe for poor grid resolution. So these are all the signs of poor grid resolution. Rolling behavior, but as you go to longer wavelengths or lower frequencies, conservation gets better and the answers get better. So if that's happening, that's the sure sign of a grid resolution problem. PML size. Let's say our PML was not big enough. Well, this is something that's not going to get better with increasing or decreasing wavelength or frequency. But we see a rolling behavior. That's due to standing waves. If we have a PML that's too small, it's reflecting. It's forming a standing wave. And as we change our frequency or wavelength, that standing wave moves and we get a rolling behavior in our response. Notice conservation, it, it's not 100%. It passes through just by coincidence through 100% somewhere, but then it just keeps going up. So our, our answer is not getting better with wavelength or frequency. So it's not a grid resolution problem. In this case, it's a PML problem. So what about this spacer region? We said we need the PML spaced about a wavelength away, and that's just a rule of thumb. We have to model it, look for the consequences of that spacer region being too small, and if we see that, we fix it. So what happens is, if the evanescent field touches the PML, it is evanescent as it passes through that, the, the area where we're recording reflection or transmission. So we don't count it as energy reflected or transmitted. Once we reach the PML, refractive index goes up. And in fact, that evanescent field could be a, suddenly a supported wave. And so it's sucking energy out of your model that we're not counting it as being reflected or transmitted because in our record planes where we're extracting transmitted reflected fields, it is evanescent there. It's only non-evanescent in the PMLs where we're not looking at the fields anymore. So if it's sucking energy out, that means our, our conservation is gonna be way off. So we see nice conservation, that all of a sudden conservation and transmission goes way up here. So this violation of conservation, particularly around this resonance where we know we're going to get large electromagnetic or large evanescent fields, that's a sure sign that the spacer region was too short. In this case, I set it to lambda over five, should be more like lambda. And if we made it lambda over 10, that's even smaller, it would be even worse. And you'll notice that the the uh, deviations in conservation will be worse around cutoffs where we tend to have these large evanescent fields that can slice through our, our record planes and touch the PMLs and suddenly couple to propagating waves. Okay, so what about finite size devices? These are not periodic. How do we handle that? Well, in fact, we really know all the same rules. There's just a little bit of a difference. Now we have a PML going all the way around, but our device is still in the middle, and we still have about a wavelength separating our device and the PML. We, got, we now have a total field scatter field region that forms a box, and notice it is outside the PML just slightly, and that lets us have this region between the total field scatter field interface and the PML to record scattered fields but I still like to keep my PMLs about 20 cells. So this really is just a repeat of the rules we use for periodic structures. We just don't have those periodic boundaries on the left and right anymore. We have to use a PML and we need space between the device and the PML. So this shouldn't be too much of a surprise. 
final topic for this short uh, short lecture is the validity of this periodic approximation. So if we assume something's infinitely periodic, but we know it truly isn't, what does that mean? How do we visualize that? So here is the field around something that has, I don't know, a dozen or so unit cells. But notice in the middle, around this region, the, the field really does repeat. So this periodic boundary condition is going to give us a pretty accurate picture out to maybe the outer three or four cells or so. Notice it starts to change around here. And there's effects around the edges due to diffraction and other craziness where the periodic boundary condition fails to predict how it's going to behave out here. And likewise the other side. So in this case I would draw a line somewhere around where I have this cursor and say the periodic boundary condition will behave how the device behaves in the middle here but not the outer three cells. And very often when we design devices we're really only illuminating it in the middle. We're not using the edges because we know crazy things happen in the edges. Now if behavior around the edges is important to you then you can't make the infinitely periodic approximation and you have to model a device like this. But this simulation that you're looking at takes probably a hundred times longer than simulating just one little unit cell. So there's more information there. We can actually play games with the edges and get it to work better, but it is a lot more computationally intense to do that. Also notice, we used a PML around the whole outside for this. And notice this discontinuity. That's their, our total field scatter field interface. Now the PML regions I actually clipped off so I'm not showing it. So you don't actually see the wave being absorbed into that because I clipped it and it's out here. Maybe I should make this picture again and show that. But you can definitely see the total field scatter code interface. So just for your interest, um, if we have a pretty conventional guided mode resonance filter made out of something with a dielectric constant around two and a half and we plotted its response Here's what it looks like for the infinite case. We see we get this nice reflection peak. Well, if we only build it out of 33 periods, we see some ripples, but it doesn't seem like it's doing a whole lot. 66 periods, eh, we're starting to get a, a spike. We can see something happening. 132 periods, we're getting a, a pretty strong spike now, but not as strong as this one. By the time we get to 200 periods, I would say that's looking pretty close to the infinite case. Not exactly, but I would conclude from this that our device needs to be about 200 periods to behave like the infinitely periodic device. So that's a short story about the validity of this infinitely periodic uh, approximation and the end of this lecture.